Let's uh, wind the clock back to 1911. Dr. Harvey Cushing, who's a pioneer neurosurgeon uh, and pioneered so many things around brain surgery and father of medicine in many different ways. He said in a letter, I would like to see the day where someone, somewhere, is appointed the surgeon, but they have no hands, for the operating is the least part of the work. I wonder if back then he knew that someone like me, because I can't use my hands, would be working in a busy emergency department in 2023. But uh, I always think it's actually a miracle now, even the fact that I'm alive. Because if we wind the clock back then, 1911, the life expectancy for someone like me was 18 months with a spinal cord injury. So we've come a long way. I can live a near normal lifespan. And along the way, we've had many, many discoveries like penicillin, ultrasound, IVF, and even today, we have robots that can perform surgeries. Would you believe there can be a surgeon in a big hospital, in a big city, that can operate a machine thousands of kilometers away and perform a procedure on a patient and potentially save their life? So we have a lot of technology, and it's sexy. These are the things that make the headlines, right? Media loves it, we hype it up, and we get excited about these things. Even through COVID, for the first time in human history, we discovered how to make a vaccine quickly. And now we've got through the pandemic. So there's a lot of sexy things going on in medicine, and our profession will have you believe that we're innovative, we're forward thinking. But the reality is, we're not. Medicine is an incredibly conservative profession and for those who are trying to bring these innovations to the front line, they have an uphill battle. Many of these machines, many of these robots sitting operating theaters not being used for a long period of time. And many of our innovation take years, if not decades, to get to the front line. You go through trials and you spend millions of dollars and if you're lucky, at the end of it, you might have regulatory approval to use it. But we're also at a time where our healthcare systems are under pressure. Read the headlines. Emergency departments, lots of patients waiting. Waiting lists for procedures, clinics are full. Lots of pressure on doctors and medical staff. So while we have all these innovations, why are we not winning? Well, if you dig underneath the surface, if you look under the hood, in 2023, medicine still has a lot of old practices, a lot of old traditions. So would you believe in some of our biggest hospitals, flagship, big hospitals, tertiary centers, they still have paper records. So someone will still have to fetch big piles of paper, big folders, flick through them, find the information that you want, and spend all that time trying to treat your patient. Some hospitals still have a typing pool. So the doctor will see you, pick up the phone, make a phone call, and then their voice will be recorded. And a typist at the other end will type out the letter, and it will come back to the doctor, who will then edit it, send it back, and then it will go to the mail room, where it will be printed, put into an envelope by a person, and sent to the patient. In this day and age, when we have email and SMS on all these other secure electronic means, this is still happening under the hood. So I've been thinking about it ever since I came back to medical school, and uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, isn't it? So thinking back to what uh, Dr. Cushing said, I came back 
as a medical student who couldn't use his hands. And I was trying to figure out, how do I function? How do I perform best? Because a lot of people said, oh, I don't think you'll be able to be a doctor anymore if you can't use your hands. I didn't just want to be a doctor. I wanted to be better than everyone else. So I started thinking about how I could do that. And I started thinking, okay, we have all this sexy technology, but how can I make myself really quick? And I thought about making some marginal gains, just getting 1% better here and there. And so, instead of using the computers and instead of using the paper records, I got myself an iPad. And on my tablet computer, I uh, connected to the hospital's electronic medical record. I got all the forms that I needed in digital versions. I hijacked some of the printers around the hospital and I started carrying this around with me to work. I did all the ward rounds with it, saw all my patients with my tablet in tow. And suddenly, I'd streamlined my workflow. In my first year as a doctor in the emergency department, I was seeing about 25% more patients than my colleagues. Then I started using dictation. So I hooked up a dictaphone onto the computer and I started dictating my notes after that. And soon, some of my colleagues started saying, oh, how do you do that? I want to use that too. And then I started using other technology. So today I carry an ultrasound in my pocket and uh, the ultrasound connects to my mobile phone. And some of the best moments I've had in medicine was just using this little machine. Now think about it. We still carry on the stethoscope, which was invented in the 1800s. And actually today the data shows that uh, the stethoscope is becoming a more symbolic thing. So if a doctor carries a stethoscope around their neck, they're more trusted. But when we put that to someone's chest, we're actually making inferences on the sounds that we hear. But with the little ultrasound I carry in my pocket, I can see the structure of someone's heart. I can see anatomy inside their belly. And I can make better decisions and better choices about what we do for the patient. But some of the best moments come from doing something simpler than that. There have been some really late nights where I work in our emergency department and uh, there's one memory I have and it was of a distressed mum. She was pregnant, she'd been bleeding and she was worried, scared that she was having a miscarriage. So she comes to the ED and she's in tears. It was harrowing. So we find her a bed, and I whip out my ultrasound, and I said, let's have a look. And so we put my phone on, and uh, she could see the screen, and I pop my ultrasound on, and there we go. We can see a little baby with a little heartbeat moving around. And the instant relief on that mom's face was priceless. And those are the best moments in medicine that we will never forget. Sometimes we think that technology is a distraction. Sometimes we think that it's expensive. Sometimes we think that these innovations are not useful. They're too tricky. But actually, these are useful. These are necessary. These things make medicine better. These things make medicine faster. And it's not even about the sexy stuff. It's about the simple stuff. How do we get a letter out to someone quickly? How do we look at someone's heart by the bedside? How do we get better care out to rural communities where they don't have all this? But at the heart of all this is a human being. And I think we have to focus back on why we do what we do because of another person. And that's what technology is about. The author of The Creative Destruction of Medicine, Dr. Eric Topol, once said that medicine and technology 
in medicine is not a distraction. Rather, it's a way to restore the time-honored tradition of the doctor-patient relationship. I love the practice of medicine and I consider myself a friend to it. And I think friends tell each other the truth and friends are honest with each other. And to my friend, I say today, we need to move forward, we need to adapt, and we need to go into the future now. And if you are a friend of medicine, I encourage you to say that too. Thank you.